So I found myself in Costa Rica after creating a life I really loved in LA, in the jungle, with having no idea where I'm going next, mm -hmm. having left our home, my relationship, my closest community, and really sitting in the space of the unknown. This is Awakened Love, the podcast, and I'm your host, Angel. This is a space where we get real, real about sex, love, and awakening. So strap in, let's go deep. What's up, beautiful awakened humans? Welcome to another episode of Awakened Love. And today we have Zahara Zimring. Zahara Zimring is a ceremonialist, a liberation artist. She has a background in evolutionary astrology. She is one of my dearest sisters. She is such a sincere spiritual seeker, an incredible aspiration of a woman on the path. And I'm very, very elated to have her here with us today. What's up, beautiful awakened beings? Wow, I can already feel the potency of this connection. This Zahara Zimring, dear sister, medicine woman, seeker, makes me think of the word satsang. We translate that as community, but another translation of that is truth seekers. And I mm. see you, my love, as such a sincere seeker. Not only that, but I trust your facilitation so profoundly and considering my special brand of trauma and particularly around my learning to trust um, your trustability has been such a profound gift in my life over the last I think seven years or so so to have you here is just extra special and I just want to share my deep gratitude for you showing up and all that you are mm -hmm. one of my intentions when we opened up the prayer field was to listen deeply and really allow. And so let me just listen to that and allow it to land. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just feels, feels so good to be here present with you, Angel, and appreciating the lifetimes we've walked together already in this one lifetime, <laughs> seven years. Wow. I'm really appreciating right now, you know, how much has happened in seven years and how actually like many lifetimes have occurred in that time for each one of us. And also how quickly it's gone by <laughs> at the same time, like all at once, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, there's such, such beauty in the willingness for both of us to keep leaning in and be vulnerable over and over again to let ourselves be held through some of the most wildly transformational mm. periods of both of our lives. And that's what builds the trust that you're speaking to, you know, and I really pray, you know, the, the value I feel in, in the depth of relationship that we have and the trustability presence present here, you know, I really pray that everyone gets to experience that depth of intimacy. Mm. And I think one thing that it's really taken as active, creators of that type of friendship is willingness to be vulnerable <laughs> you know like I yeah. think a lot of people want deep sisterhood and deep friendship but it can feel really scary especially if you have wounds around trust to lean in to your to your sisters and let yourself be seen and let yourself be known in the imperfect and in the wobbly and in the, these are the parts that are unlovable, especially if we're afraid of losing love or being abandoned or that we'll be violated or, you know, uh, betrayed in some way based on past experiences to lean in to the holding of another mm. takes a lot of courage, mm. takes a lot of courage. And that's something I've witnessed us both do again and again. So you know, we can pray for the depth of sisterhood, you know, and I really do pray that for everyone. And a huge part of what I do in the world is to help create containers that actually hold the space for the dojo women to experience the depth of sisterhood that we have. And it's happening and a huge, but we got to be active participants in that. We've got to lean in and say yes. And in order to do that, You've got to let yourself be seen in the places that you, there's a part of you that just doesn't believe it's safe to, mm -hmm. and then get a corrective experience of it actually being safe. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. I hope those listening can already feel the potency of this woman's channel and the transmission that is her beingness. And 
Yeah, leaning in when you want to lean out. That's the work. My my word we talked about on, on your podcast, which for those listening, check it out. It's the Dojo podcast. Uh-huh, the Dojo podcast, and you can find it at the Dojo Council on Instagram. The links are on there. Yeah, and we just recorded a beautiful episode where we were in this emergent field together, and I was saying my word for last year was listen. And my word coming into this next year is aliveness, and my tool is expose. And that what you were talking Ooh. about, that willingness to expose is what creates and restores aliveness, especially as you say, when you think I can't expose this, I can't share this truth, I can't reveal this part of me. Um, and to lean in anyway, as you're describing, creates such depth of trust and intimacy. Um, and for those listening, Zahara and I actually did a podcast, uh, I think a couple of years ago now in the beginnings of the podcast. So if you wanna hear like her origin story, that podcast is there. But for today, what I'm curious about is we're talking about this kind of seven year cycle, which I know you also have a background in evolutionary evolutionary astrology. So perhaps you can speak a little to like, what is a seven year cycle, but particularly the last few years, you've been going through the fires of death and rebirth and you are true to your scorpionic nature, walking that path with such fierceness and grace. And it's been such a beauty to witness. And I would love to just open the space for you to share about and expose. Um, what has that been like for you? What have you been learning? And a little about that death and rebirth through this seven year cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. You know, Angel, <laughs> I wasn't entirely convinced about this whole seven year cycle thing until I turned 35. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like, <laughs> And I, I felt like finally at age 35, I'm 37 now. So I've got two years post the seven year cycle, massive crumbling of everything in my known universe. I experienced at 35 to look back with perspective and not only two years back from 37 to 35, but at 35, you know, being able to look back seven years before that you know, which is 28 and be like, and really see, oh, wow. Right. And then seven years before that, and it's 21. And I, I looked at that and it's, there's something with age. <laughs> it's so funny. I can see your face. If you're watching this on YouTube, angels tracking. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> yes. I think the fire yeah. happened at 28. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. 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 Crazy. Mm -hmm. But yes. Well, yeah, it's crazy. And, and it really took, you know, at 28, I still couldn't see it. I, I couldn't, I didn't have enough life and legs under my experience. Some things you just have to experience for yourself. And I didn't have enough life experience to recognize the larger, longer patterns. Mm. And so I felt like at 35, I had gained just enough life experience and just enough perspective to hold perspective around the death portal that I could feel I was entering into. And so I was like in it, I was the experiencer of it. And I'll give some details so everybody can ride with me. I was the experiencer of it. And I was witnessing the one experiencing it and able to hold her with total compassion by looking at when I was 28 and everything fell apart. And seeing how I moved through that and how after everything fell apart, it came back together in such higher order, <laughs> such higher order, like complete, complete reset in, in the way that I needed the most. So I'll, I'll actually start there. So when I was, um, I, after I uh, graduated Rice University, I, I had many eras in my life. So growing up, I was training for the Olympics in Taekwondo. So I was the Taekwondo girl. And then I had a spinal surgery when I was mm. a, about 20. So right around that 21 year cycle, right? 21 year, seven year cycle just before it. That's when I, I had this major spinal surgery and had to be taken out of Taekwondo. So I stopped training and that reset the trajectory of my life. When I graduated from Rice University, you know, I, from Taekwondo, I had the reference point of what it felt like to be truly passionate about something. And so I thought that when I graduated, working in sports would be close to the passion I felt as an athlete. So I had a whole era 
as a marketing executive for one of the biggest major league baseball agencies in the country and then for a big NFL agency. So I had this era of working in sports, but being behind the desk is certainly not the same as it is to be the one living out your dream on the field or in the dojo, right? Which is what I had the reference point of. So I lived my, you know, formative from graduating from college into 28 in the agency world. And I had a lot of ego attachment to the title, the executive director of one of the biggest agencies in the country. And because I moved up very quickly and very young, I got to see, wow, this is what it's like at the top. And this does not feel like the Taekwondo feeling. And so I became depressed. I started numbing myself with prescriptions. You go to Western medical doctors, you know, I should be happy. What's wrong with me? I can't sleep. I have anxiety. Well, there's a pill for that. So I I had couldn't wake up without taking an Adderall or go to sleep without taking an Ambien. And that's what drove me. I was augmenting my life force energy to hold the shell of this life that gave my ego a kick together But from the inside out, I was dying. I would literally close my office door and cry. And so around 28, I turned myself in. (laughs) I went to my doctors and said, I am totally dependent on these prescriptions. There's no way I'm getting off of them. I need a recommendation for medical leave. And they gave it to me and I gave that to my bosses and they gave me full-time pay to go to treatment in Newport Beach. Mm. And that's where what I did when I was about 28 wow, and I, you know, had the experience of being in treatment in a place that they were calling the penthouse because I still had this full-time job. They're like, do you really need to plummet to the floor? Do you really need to hit rock bottom? And I got to sit in circle with women who had hit rock bottom, who were in treatment for the seventh time, the eighth time getting off of heroin, that their parents and families were afraid if they didn't get get it, kick it this time, that they wouldn't make it. And so I found myself in this fancy treatment, beautiful mansion in Newport Beach, right on the beach, right on the ocean, like you walk out of the back door and your feet are on the sand. Mm. So with, I think it was like eight women in a house and a bunch of facilitators that are facilitating group therapy, hypnotherapy, EMDR, meditation, yoga, all of it, right? Eating well, waking up at sunrise, seeing the sun rising, watching the sun setting, being in nature, immersed in that way from having lived in Beverly Hills and LA and in Houston, Dallas, right? Being in big cities, all of a sudden, I'm in this pristine, still, beautifully wondrous natural environment while I'm sitting in circle, essentially, talking about what's real with other women who are raw, authentic, on their knees, If life knocks you on your knees, that's a good place to pray from. Mm -hmm. So now I'm being knocked on my knees and I'm praying for the first time Mm -hmm. and I'm having an awakening and I realize there's no way I can go back to this, this job. I won't make it a day without wanting to take some sort of prescription because this is not what I'm meant to be doing. Right. And thank God I have the Taekwondo reference point to show me that this isn't it. This agency career that everything from the outside in tells me is what success looks like is not it. So after treatment, I got off all the prescriptions and I had this awakening where I went back. I left the agency career, which was a huge ego death. I had to remove myself from a lot of relationships and friendships that were, you know, leaning on to substance and partying a lot and everything in the sports and entertainment world that was no longer a match. And I went into what I call my incubation period, which is where I got my dog Hugo. I had about six months left on my lease in Houston and I, everything known, I went through this big death process and I didn't have the full perspective at that time. So it was really, I'm, I, the words I'm saying make it sound very empowering. And from this point of reflection, it was, Mm -hmm. but this was a, you know, six months to a year's worth of many moments on my knees, terrified, like, (sighs) what am I doing? And so, you know, I had this time in my incubation period in Houston, and that led to what I call, you know, the period of my original awakening, as I became more aware of myself, my heart, my truth, consciousness, how to love myself, how to hold myself, And that's when I moved back to 
California. I actually went to Newport Beach first Mm -hmm. because I had such a deep relationship with the nature there. And that, you know, that's where I had my inspiration to start my first wellness company. And it was directly related to my own commitment to my own wellness. And that's what led to the next seven years. So over the next seven years towards 35, as you can feel, I imagine there was this full reset clean slate that happened. Mm -hmm. So over the next seven years, it was this rebuild from an authentic place Mm -hmm. where I got to step into my facilitatorship through facilitating, shamaning my own process of awakening, my own process of healing, my own deep willingness to look at the deep traumas that I had yet to touch, to feel through and heal through the parts of my being that had been deeply wounded, to be willing to feel the parts that I had deemed unlovable and find how to love them. And that looked like a lot of things. That looked like a two-year spiritual psychology program at USM. That looked like a deep dive into evolutionary astrology and an apprenticeship program. That looked like deep work with Dr. Joe Dispenza, with uh, plant medicine and a variety of different you know, teachers in the shamanic space. There was a deep commitment. I applied my Taekwondo passion to the journey of awakening, of self-actualization, And it ultimately led to the birthing of the dojo ecosystem, which now you can feel where the the word dojo, the origin points of it for me are from that Taekwondo era, which is where I came up, the space inside of which I would go to train and feel my aliveness, Mm. feel my passion, Mm. feel no doubt that I'm exactly where I need to be. And there's a courage and a willingness to face off with your edges. Mm. And now it's the transformational arena. It's the dojo that is our lives. All of the dojo containers are invitations to identify where your fear-based leading edge is at and expand beyond it in real time. Mm. So at 35, I found myself in a four-year relationship with a beautiful man. I found myself in a gorgeous dream house in the Palisades overlooking the ocean. I found myself surrounded by community that I love that were reflecting truth to me. I found myself serving in a good way holding ceremony, feeling like I'm attracting my dream clients, feeling more on purpose than ever. And then suddenly I felt stagnant. I started to feel like I grew into the britches of the physical world reality that I had created. And as a liberation artist, I recognized that the integrity of the work that I do, which is to invite others to meet and expand beyond their fear-based edges, Mm -hmm. which we are finite beings channeling the infinite through our finite physical vessel. So we're infinite beings, my my apologies, we're infinite beings channeling the infinite through the finite of the physical. Mm -hmm. And so to me, what that means is that there will always be, if we're in a body, there's another next leading edge of your life that is always calling you forward. Oh, baby. (laughs) Yes. And and we get to recognize that again and again, and we get to accept unconditionally that that is the nature of being human. Mm -hmm. And it is also important to integrate when you move through a big edge. And it's very important to stabilize when you move through a big edge and not just be thirsty for the hit of like the next one and the next one and the next one, because then they're, you're not fully stabilizing in the new level of being, yes. right? So both yes. are important. And a huge part of the work that I do is invite individuals who are stable at one level of being and are deeply knocking on the door of the next one. Like when you can feel, wow, I'm either stagnating or I'm resisting, right? There are two different things. Stagnation, if there's a an edge that's calling you forward into the next level of your life, if it often can feel like you start to either feel stagnant, like what's here is as you start to feel apathetic, mm-hmm. stagnant, like there's mm-hmm. no more juice or excitement or aliveness. It's just same, same, you know, that's a signal. Oh, there's a growth spurt that wants to happen. Mm-hmm. Or you're feeling resistance, 
which is like <laughs> a lot of resistance to the awareness that there's something that wants to be said, expressed, lived into that feels really, really scary. And so there's an active resistance that can look like many things, distraction, overdoing, underdoing, you know, how your resistance expresses itself is very variable, mm -hmm. right? But those are signals. Am I like in resistance where I feel this tug and pull in my being? Do I, or do I feel just lethargic, mm -hmm. apathetic? You know, those are signals. Wow. There's and I'll, there's actually a, a call forth. Yes. So for me, as a liberation artist, I, I love to stand on the other side of that edge and call the women and men in my field forth and be a space for them to entrain into in a trustable way that says, you, it is safe for you to step across this edge into what was previously a no-go zone mm -hmm. because over here, there's something that you're afraid to feel. Mm -hmm. And I love being a safe space for those in my field to feel mm -hmm. what they've been afraid to feel and set a new reference point and create corrective experiences that signal the physiology and the spirit that it is safe to go there, mm -hmm. that I don't need to hold myself back in protection so that I don't have to risk feeling that one thing mm -hmm. that I'm afraid to feel. Mm. I will no longer keep myself small. I will no longer hold on to sameness out of fear of the unknown. But I will step across that threshold and I'm willing to risk feeling what I've been afraid to feel in service of full aliveness. Mm. Say so I love to be that space. Mm -hmm. And I realized when I started feeling stagnant at 35, surrounded by a physical world reality in a relationship field, that is everything I thought that I wanted. But yet I was starting to feel stagnant mm -hmm. and I was resisting my own stagnation for a minute because I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Yep. Right? Because my no, no, no was oh no 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 i don't i am terrified to feel what's on the other side of change yeah. because everything that is here now is what i thought that i wanted and i feel safe but yet i feel stagnant mm. and so i recognized this is now having the perspective that felt really important to be able to see that there was a big wave of change coming and that I, I gave myself permission to resist it for, for a little bit, mm -hmm. just to kind of not break a leg, but to <laughs> take some deep breaths and like fortify my energy. And, you know, I, I did resist for a minute the reality that I was feeling stagnant in my four year relationship with a man I thought I'd spend the rest of my life with. Mm -hmm. I did resist that the dream house we were living in was not actually the full, full, full dream house. Mm -hmm. We were renting it. There were neighbors on both sides, you know, that it, there wasn't enough real space to do the work that I feel I'm here to do, right, without disturbing neighbors, you know. Mm -hmm. So there were so many layers. There was L.A. itself. I had been there for seven, eight years, you know, and I was starting to feel like, wow, I, I, I have I haven't experienced other places. Yeah. And I feel like there's more out there calling me forth. And I am afraid to let all of this go. And so I got to feel that. And then the first domino came where our landlord called and said he was selling our house I at remember. 35. Yeah, mm -hmm. at 35. And my prior partner, you know, and I realized that, all right, this is a signal that it's time for us to leave L.A., so we decided together that we would go travel and leave LA. So I was still resisting a bit of the realization that even the relationship itself was coming to its end. Mm -hmm. And one week before we moved out of the house, the house is being put in boxes. Everything is, is being prepared to go into storage. I'm watching everything we created be dismantled. And then this major pop in our relationship came and I suggested that we take space. And this pop came on the, on the heels of months and months and months of smaller pops, Yeah, you know, that we were just trying and trying and trying to work through 
and resisting the stagnation and what wasn't no longer a match romantically. And this big pop came. And one week before we moved out of the house, we decided to go our separate ways in the begin when we moved out of the house to take space which was still a form of resisting that the relationship was fully ending, but we needed to go step by step. Yes, so which is important, Mex- I think. It's a, it's a beautiful, and you brought yeah. that up earlier to say that, you know, there was a level of resistance, so you didn't break a leg. And I liked that analogy because I think it gives people permission to recognize that, as you say, it's okay to go step by step. It's There's, there's an okay. okayness to that, yeah. Easy, mm-hmm. easy does it. <laughs> so easy yeah, easy does it you took your space <laughs> yeah yeah that is really important to name you mm-hmm. know like it 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 allows you to actually stabilize in each next step like if you imagine a mountain goat on the side of a mountain mm-hmm. and once that leap is taken from one side of the cliff to the next little cliff rock outpouring it, that goat's not going backwards. It's got an aim towards the summit. But if you watch mountain goats, they just kind of like hang out on the step that they're on until they've calculated and they really stabilize and are ready to take that next leap. Mm-hmm. And so the whole body can come along for the ride. And it can be really sure that that next leap is the leap. Yes. Right. And so we, he went to Mexico, I went to Costa Rica and I found myself in Costa Rica, having moved out of the house, having left LA, aware that I was not planning to go back, Mm -hmm. having separated from my partner for years, who I would not see again for a year, even though we didn't know it yet. Wow. And whoa, I didn't put that piece together. I I mean, I was with you along for the ride, but I just never recognized that. That's an wow. There's an intensity to that. It was very intense. When we said goodbye at the airport, we were still technically together, but saying we were going to take space. And then after a month in Costa Rica, we ended the relationship. So I found myself in Costa Rica after creating a life I really loved in LA, in the jungle, (laughs) with having no idea where I'm going next, Mm -hmm. having left our home, my relationship, my closest community, and really sitting in the space of the unknown. Mm. And that was at 35. (laughs) So talk about a seven year. year. (laughs) And this was a major initiation for me for the very first time into the unknown. And I could feel how it was connected to my service in the world because my integrity to invite others to let go of everything that does not serve and move into a space of the unknown where fresh life and new life can actually occur Mm. for an individual in my space to actually trust my field and and be able to entrain into my nervous system and physiology and, and believe me when I say, you got this, I had to go through it myself. Mm -hmm. And while going through it, I had this idea that I have to do it myself. So Mm -hmm. I did have to do it myself. I had to create those reference points in my body for me. But I had an idea that I had to do it alone. Mm, Big difference. Big difference. Mm -hmm. And I was in the jungle and I was speaking to a somatic therapist and I was telling her with my facilitator hat, you know, I let go of everything known with all this perspective, right? I've let go of the home and the relationship and the friends. And I'm showing myself that I can hold myself no matter what. And she said, you know, that's powerful, Zahara. And let's take off the facilitator hat for a second. And when we look at developmental trauma, which in many ways I was facing off with in this space of not feeling like I could predict what was next, this unpredictability And there were moments where I was on my knees, like hyperventilating, like what's happened? Like, you know, just, wow. I didn't have the reference point yet that life would really show up. Mm -hmm. I didn't have it yet. Yeah. And she said, you know, if there's a baby crying and screaming, which you're now down to this like developmental space, you don't take away its bottle and its pacifier and its pillow and its mother and say, you figure this out yourself. You would say, oh my God 
bring in the blanket and the food and the bottle and the pillow and the mom and whatever you can to show the baby that its body is safe. And so while you are moving through this experience for yourself to develop a greater reference point with life, Mm -hmm. you don't have to do it alone. And it was that very next day that I walked into a coffee shop and a dear brother of mine, Ramayan, was sitting there on his computer looking at Airbnbs to move into that day in Costa Rica. And I had this big house all to myself. And I was like, you know what? (laughs) I actually have a huge space. Why don't you come? And it ended up being this beautiful two weeks together in this home where we were both going through breakups. We were both, it was just, again, I let support in, in forms that went beyond what I thought it was supposed to look like. Mm. And that was the beginning of a series that has continued through until now. I'm 37. It's been two years of life showing up step after step after step with support in ways that go beyond what I defined support as. Mm. Support shows up in the form of angels, literally Mm. angel right here, (laughs) in the form of in the form of angels like my friends and allies. For support shows up in the form of the most incredible guidance of new opportunities to serve. You know, I had this hit after Costa Rica to go to Colorado. I didn't know anybody in Colorado, but I just, I trusted the intuition that came in to facilitate the closing ceremony for the the first cohort of dojo masters. We get to Colorado. We have this incredible ceremony. I resonate highly with the land. Another friend tells me about a retreat that's happening in Colorado on a beautiful property called Everland a week after our immersion. I stay there for the week. My dog, Hugo, I post on a Facebook group for someone to watch my dog, Hugo, while I'm in this retreat. Again, I don't know anyone. I get like a hundred comments of people that want to watch my dog, Hugo, which was like also so beautiful. And someone tagged a woman in Colorado. I get on a phone call with her and I instantly I'm like, oh, this is her. We, we serve in a similar way. We became very good friends. I ended up staying at her house until the retreat. She felt like Hugo was the, her dog who had passed, had sent Hugo for her mm-hmm. to re-engage with having a dog herself. Like we, it was like this, these wild stepping stones when I just really let myself be in the unknown. I go to the retreat then. I meet the owners of the 100-acre property who invite me to their, you know, friend's trip in Moab and I stay in their RV and then a whole new Colorado community forms itself. About a month later, I stay in Colorado. I come back to LA for a friend's wedding and then they're doing a 4th of July festival on that same property, which is where I met my next partner. Mm. which who I ended up falling in love with deeply and, and being with for a year. And that kept me in Colorado even, you know, deep, more deeply start creating a life with this man and the next levels. He met me in all the ways my prior partner didn't mm. all the ways I was praying for. He met me in all of those ways. And after, you know, a lot of time together, we fell deeply in love and I realized my prior partner also met me in ways that he did not And so I got this beautiful reference point of spheres that I really appreciated, right, in my four-year relationship, but I was lacking a different area. And then my partner that I met in Colorado that I was with, my most recent partner, he met me in all those ways. So I was like, wow, this is possible too. Mm -hmm. But then I felt like I was missing the other one, you know? (sighs) And so then it was like, you know, it was like, wow, I get to be met in all, it's a this and Mm -hmm. I get to be experienced all of it. So I've been on this experience of being invited forward by life, stepping stone after, after stepping stone toward whatever form is the next truest expression of my soul, which will be more in alignment than what I had that I thought was everything I wanted at 35. But I had to be willing to liberate myself because fear, it was only fear that had me stagnating. Mm -hmm. It was my fear of losing the house and the relationship and the community that had me hold on to what was. And it was when I was willing to face off with my fear and become the me that was willing to feel the loss of all that was. Mm. 
and hold myself in that process so that I could develop a deeper trust in life. Mm. And the development of that trust in life meant not doing it alone. It meant allowing life to show up. It meant falling in love with a new partner. Mm -hmm. It meant getting evidence of new aspects of experience that I really do desire. I found myself on a 35 acre property in Colorado living there for three months, Mm -hmm. which was another aspect of something I desired that I didn't have in the Palisades. I 35 acres of beautiful mountainside property where we erected a freestanding ceremony space Mm -hmm. where I got to facilitate the live liberation dojo Mm -hmm. and deep group work. I was like, wow, life is really giving me a dose of aspects that I didn't have that I do desire to create. And I'm getting those reference points in my body. Mm -hmm. So I've learned this, you know, non-attachment to what is, and I've had to let go of that relationship I was in for a year. I had to let go of that particular property and allow life to continue to inform what's next. Mm -hmm. And I feel more rested Mm -hmm. in myself right now, even though I don't know exactly what it's all going to look like yet. Mm -hmm. On the other side of death is always the truth. Mm. And what I see as true is that every relationship that's true, including ours, that I thought I was letting go of that was going through this big death when I left LA the last time Mm -hmm. is still present in my life, but even deeper Mm -hmm. and more trustable because the idea that I have to hold on to it, effort for it, try to preserve it, be even locationally physically present or else I might lose it. It's all gone through a dissolution where instead of preservation, I'm in participation Mm -hmm. with life. Mm -hmm. Instead of feeling like I have to preserve my relationships, I can actually participate in them and allow them to go through their natural ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. Instead of feeling like I need to preserve and grip onto where it is that I live, no matter how much I love it. Mm. I can actually participate in the creation process and recognize, not resist that life by its very nature is impermanent, Mm -hmm. right? This is a part of life. And so I'm learning how to participate fully in life. And when I get the signal and when it's time for me to create roots again and build my own home base again for whatever reason which you can feel i don't need to know it's not been completely true yet for Mm -hmm. me to root in again to one place Mm -hmm. i've been called forward into service i can't even name the amount of traveling that i have been doing and that i am still doing Mm -hmm. i can barely even fathom in the next six months rooting into one place because i'm traveling so much Mm -hmm being called into service so much that I need to physically be free to serve in a variety of different locations for extended periods of time. And there's a whole cohort of women that are in this next round of the Dojo Masters program that I met in Colorado that I wouldn't have met if I were anchored and attached and holding on gripping to LA. And so when it's so it's valuable to be in this season of nomadic i'm Mm -hmm. allowing it and there will come a time (laughs) when it's time for me to root all the way in again Mm -hmm. and it's going to feel so much better Mm -hmm. than it did when i was 35 yes because when it happens i just remember when oren and i moved into that house in the palisades i loved it so much and almost instantly I was afraid of losing it. Almost instantly, I could feel a part of me that was like, ah, but we don't own this. There's going to be a time when we're going to have to let it go. Mm -hmm. I could feel this resistance to to the fact that I knew we'd have to let it go, Mm -hmm. which is like a a being afraid of the moment that would come Mm -hmm. when we would. Mm -hmm. And so the next time it's time for me to root, oh my God, Mm -hmm. I'll know, I will know that I'll be okay no matter what. Mm-hmm. I will know that I can participate fully in the creation of the space and allow it to inform what it wants to be and how long I'm meant to steward it. Mm-hmm. And of course, I'm going to desire for it to last as long as it's supposed to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But not as long as I need it to because I'm afraid of losing it. There's a difference. Mm-hmm. 
there's a difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're talking a lot about this like idea of, you know, what we fear beyond the edge and, you know, what we fear to feel essentially an experience. Um, And you touched on loss a lot. And I think that's big for a lot of us, this fear of loss. And yet, of course, everything we love, we will lose. That is the price to ride the ride. And it's also the preciousness and what makes it so sweet because it isn't guaranteed and it all ends or when you've done enough psychedelics and deep work, it all transforms and changes. (laughs) Um, But it does, it goes through an ending, like an ending portal and then things change, but that can feel really scary. So I'm curious to hear about your relationship to loss, just talking about that tender place that we each touch. Yeah. It's the covenant of life. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, it's the covenant of life when we choose to incarnate, you know, we are committing, you know, we're, we are entering into the covenant of life. Nobody gets out alive, Mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, the part of there is an aliveness. It's like the paradox. There is an aliveness to the spirit that I do really believe is transcendent of form. Yes. And so when we enter into the covenant of life, into form, incarnate, when we choose to incarnate, we are agreeing to live and to love just as much as we are agreeing to die and to lose. Yes. Let that sink in for a moment, people listening. Let that, let's slow down with that a second. Can you repeat what you just said? Yeah. When we choose to incarnate into form, Mm. we are agreeing. This is the covenant of life. We are agreeing to live and to love just as much as we are agreeing to die and to lose. Mm. (laughs) And the sentiment that we die before we die What I just said, you can take it quite literally, Mm -hmm. like physical life and physical death, Mm -hmm. but you can also take it seasonally, Mm. (laughs) you know, and what I'm describing is a part of that. And I really believe that what I'm describing, I've been through at 28 and 35. And I invite you, if you're listening to get curious about your own moments of living and loving and dying and losing that have occurred before the physical facing of it. And that's training for the moment when we do face physical death Mm -hmm. and when we do face the physical loss of the people that we love the most and the animals that we love the most, which is the ultimate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have had so much resistance. <laughs> the example is, is um, to my, my, the death, you know, of my dog, you know, that I have not, I can barely even believe I'm, ta- I can say that mm. right now, but I believe that it's healthy. It's healthy to be able to even name, right? It's healthy. And I've, I've, I joke with my teacher, you know, Every time I've gone to their land and we've gone into process together, it basically just keeps coming back to that. It keeps coming back to like the deep resistance I've had to the fact that that's going to happen one day. Mm -hmm. And this is my role dog. This is my like, he might as well be my son, you know, Mm -hmm. Hugo, Hugo, he's nine, you know, nine years old. And he's basically could be three. He's so vital, you know, and he is, he's nine, which means he was, I got him when I was 28, right? Mm. So he's synonymous with the whole description I described of my awakening mm. when I had that incubation period, when I left the job and I left all my friends and I left everything known, I got him. And so he has been with me through everything I just described. Mm-hmm. And through everything I didn't describe that you can imagine, right? Over the course of nine years of life. And 
I cannot, I wish there were words that I could say that would make it okay that we have to face loss in this life. But part of it is being okay with it not being okay. Yeah. And and then underneath that is the willingness to be okay with that it won't be okay for a while. Mm -hmm. So the question is, when it comes to loss, can you at least be willing at minimum to accept that when it comes to the ones that you love the most, that they're going to lose you or you're going to lose them. Mm -hmm. Fuck. Mm -hmm. Fuck. Damn. You know? Yeah. Patrick and and I had one of the most powerful moments, I think, of our relationship. Um, Yeah. Actually at the temple in Burning Man this year, we, you know, you go into the temple for those listening that have not been to Burning Man it's an art festival and it's in the middle of the dust and all this art is erected and then burned. So that's really ephemeral. You're very much in touch with the transient nature of beauty and aliveness. And there's just mm-hmm. this incredible community around this festival. And it's actually where Patrick and I fell in love. And the temple is a structure that is is erected in the center of the, the playa, they call it this desert space. And inside the temple is a space of honoring um, and letting go because they know the temple will be burned. And Mm -hmm. so there's all sorts of things inscribed along the walls, whether it's people expressing their trauma, their anger, their pain, asking for forgiveness. Um, There's also lots and lots and lots of memorials for those that have passed that year. And so as you walk through the space, it's thick with loss and grief and what I experienced in that space I just recognize like on a really deep embodied level how courageous we are as human beings to love as deeply as we dare to love knowing that we lose and there was just such a uh, depth of reverence for the human spirit in that moment and Patrick and I walked out of there. We'd been in silence for maybe an hour or so. It was sunrise. And um, we just wept in each other's arms. Yeah. Feeling because so deep. It all ends. <laughs> and we really went all the way into that moment together. Yeah. Which is wow. hard to do on a day to day basis. Like, you don't necessarily touch that when you're safe inside, whether it's the home you love or the job you love or the relate, the relationships. And we really, really touched that and looked at each other. And I don't think we've ever had as much gratitude for each other as we had in that moment, as we fully honored the truth that one day in some way we will lose each other. And we rode, <laughs> we rode around the playa just listening to music, bawling our eyes out. <laughs> and it was so beautiful. And that was the first year we've been, I think, five times together. He's been six times, I've been five times. And that was the first time we actually stayed to watch the temple burn. And it was just so special, again, just to touch that, um, to have relationship with that loss. And I think that's why Buddhists have the practice of, of having relationship to death and doing the walking meditation where each step I could die by the time I get there, I could die by the time I get there. Because as I feel so moved, it's like, it brings you in touch with the cost, as you said, the covenant of life, but also there's a reward. Like there's a, there's a preciousness. It's the price and the preciousness. So yeah, I just, I just, um, speaking of loss and like actually touching and having relationship to that, it, it reminded me of that story. So I just wanted to bring it forward. Wow. Thank you for bringing that forward. That's mm. yeah. One of the most moving things that I've ever heard. <laughs> mm. It is. Mm. And it really speaks to the union that you share mm. and like the North star of relationship and just how honest you know, if you, if I'm, I'm sure everybody can feel just through the vulnerability of being honest about that with each other is the ultimate form of intimacy. Mm. And it just cracks you open to even deeper love 
And I really honor the willingness that both of you demonstrated in that moment to not resist or avoid truth, Mm. but actually lean into it. And that's just such a North star Mm. for me. And thank you for being such an example. I, I just, yeah, like I'm in awe of the real life love that you guys Mm. share. And it also really speaks to the power of non-resistance. You know, I witness with the work that I do a lot, you know, the, the most work happens around resistance. Mm. The most work happens around resistance. Your healing <sighs> yes. begins, your healing begins where the resistance ends. Mm. The healing cannot start actually until there's a true acceptance of what has occurred and what mm. will occur in the frame of in the frame of the the death or the loss theme it's accepting what will be there which is the willingness i'm speaking of which if you're willing to accept what will occur then that actually increases for me in the example with my dog or with you with patrick you know, and I hope there'll be a man on the scene where, you know, he, yes, you know, I can feel course. that level of love, you know, and it's in the willingness that the acceptance of what's there can happen. And that unlocks a whole new level of appreciation so that you're actually appreciating this being while you are here together in the physical. But if you're not even willing to see that that loss will happen the ability to appreciate and be that intimate and touch that depth with the being that you're afraid to lose while they're here yes. is also stifled. Yes. You can't so selectively just, numb. If you numb you facing the loss, you numb experiencing the love. That's right. And then on the other side, when we talk about trauma healing, and I got to see some of this at the dojo immersion this weekend, you know, and, and and I've witnessed this in myself over the years of my own healing is that when we start to look at trauma that we've experienced along the course of our life, some traumas that we've experienced or, or that, you know, individuals that we know have experienced is so big and is so enormous that rightfully so there have been major protections placed around it to the degree that there's barely even an acceptance that it even happened. Mm -hmm. And so I see in a lot of the work that I do in the deeper dojo containers, we start to reveal and create the space to reveal, you know, the root of some of these protection mechanisms that we see operating in our lives. And when I see some of the women start to unlock what really happened at the root of some of these protection mechanisms, like the, mm. the actual experience that employed the trauma gets mm. revealed. What usually happens first is a major wave of resistance. Mm-hmm. And what that can look like is no, 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 Fuck no, fuck no, no, no. Like, it's mm. just like, no, no. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this, there's just this swatting away of it. Mm -hmm. And that can last for a really long time. And that's Mm -hmm. understandable. Mm -hmm. So when we look in that direction, it's also really important to see that the resistance makes sense, Mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, it makes sense that I would really resist that this happened to me. Mm -hmm. And it's still true that the healing begins, the actual healing begins where the resistance ends. Mm -hmm. And so the ask in that is, as the resistance gases itself out and we at the same time cultivate the tools and the skills and the perspective to actually be with the you that went through that Mm -hmm. acceptance is the door you have to walk through that that's at the end of resistance is Mm -hmm. accepting that this happened Mm -hmm. and the change right like that's Mm -hmm. the thing oftentimes we're resisting too is that everything changes and something's changing in this moment think sands are shifting and like Mm -hmm. that can be so fucking hard as you explained in your your period you're like this is the home I thought and the man I thought I was gonna be with for the rest of my life it's like it's really calls deep on our courage to meet the the fact that something's changing or if you're meeting trauma and you're like oh me being able to keep this trap door closed is changing That's right. It's the protection. You, we get really addicted to our protection mechanisms. And so if you accept 
which is where the healing begins, accept that this thing happened. And then through the door of acceptance, you can actually feel what you've been protecting yourself from feeling. Mm -hmm. And the feeling leads to the healing because Mm -hmm. you learn how to be with yourself and process the unprocessed emotions. And and, and in that door, when you're on the other side of it, you can actually meet the parts of you that need your unconditional love and compassion the most, right? But if you're resisting that it's even there, then you can't send it. If the trap door is closed, it, you also can't get the love in there. We can't meet the moment. Needed. Like the moment is different. And if you're resisting that the moment has changed, then you're resisting the moment and you're resisting all the forces in the universe and 7 billion years of evolution that have conspired to make this moment exactly as it is. And we know how that game ends because I still try it out. (laughs) And, you know, or it's like that acceptance. This moment is different. I am forever changed. I am never going backwards. I'm the mountain goat on the edge of the cliff and I can't go back. There's no right. going back. <laughs> and the embrace of that is the embrace of what's here. And the embrace of what's here is the healing, as you say. Like now, now, now we can begin because we're now here we in this begin. moment. That's it. That's that's the medicine right there. Mm. And I witness miracles occur right there. That's yeah. where the miracle of total self-acceptance, of total mm. acceptance of the moment that is a reflection mm. of the self mm-hmm. and unconditional love what we call universal love mm-hmm. can actually occur. I, I actually, in the Gene Keys, I'm doing the Venus course right now, and I have um, number 25 in my attractor field, which is where we are in that course right now. I'm sorry mm-hmm. if I'm speaking another language for any of you. <laughs> um, but I'm saying that because that number goes from the shadow of constriction, mm-hmm. which you could also experience as resistance, to the gift of acceptance Mm. to the city of universal love. Yes. That's why I love somatic so much. And I think you experience that perhaps in ceremonial space too, is there's a similarity there is like the body is always right here, right now. The body's never anywhere else, but in its present moment experience. And when we come back home into the body and reconnect to the sensations, which is a whole process, based on trauma and past experiences and not feeling safe to stay in our body and connected to our needs and our emotions and our sensations. And once we fortify that reconnection, we can come home into this moment now. And it's through exactly as you described the path of acceptance. Um, Wow. I feel like we could be here swimming in consciousness forever and thank goodness you're dear sister. So we just get to continue doing this. But for those of you listening, you got to be a fly on the wall for this incredible powerhouse, wisdom keeper, seeker, teacher, lover, friend, beautiful human that she is. Um, Where can people find you if they want more of your work? Yeah, you can find me at Zahara Zimring, Z-A-H-A-R-A-Z-I-M-R-I-N-G dot com Mm. and at Zahara Zimring on Instagram. I really keep everyone updated around all the containers that are coming forward inside the dojo ecosystem. I also have the dojo podcast. So we release Mm -hmm. episodes every week, including the one with Angel. So there's a lot of ways to find me and and go deeper. And I would Mm. love to hear from any of you who are feeling the spark. Mm. Yes, I could not recommend this woman's medicine, her unique gifts, her facilitation more. She's incredible. And I don't need to tell you because you just spent an hour with her. So (laughs) run, don't walk. And um, I'd love to finish off with some rapid fire questions. And in true dojo nature, I'm actually going to improvise them. (laughs) (laughs) So um, I did these questions on my Instagram recently. And so I want to do some of those and like see where we, where we go from there. But one of them was what makes you feel safe in relationships? No matter what. Mm. The feeling of no matter what. In, mm. like individuals who will stay the course where I can be imperfect and wobbly and squirmy and all of it. And I could just feel that this one leans in again and again and again. So it's mm. the energy of no matter what. Mm. Oh, I got goosebumps. What turns you on? Fastest way to turn you on? Mm. Commitment. <laughs> yes. Fastest way to turn you off. Uh, 
um, like not being dependable, slippery energy, mm. like mm. kind of disappear, like not, not being dependable. Mm-hmm. That's like, look. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What is considered traditionally non-sexual, but yeah. is very, uh, feels like foreplay to you? Mm, non-sexual foreplay? Yeah, like it wouldn't necessarily be considered traditional foreplay, but it feels like foreplay to you. Yeah, um, like deep, unwavering eye contact where mm. I feel like, you know, a man can stay with me and meet me there mm. and, and yeah, stay with me, stay mm. with me. Oof, mm-hmm. yes. Ah, eye gazing, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but not like the corner we're going to sit in a room with other people and I get like, no, like we're talking about something that's real and could be considered so um, gazing, un- uncomfortable or like, or it intimate, like really deeply intimate, vulnerable mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. And a man that can like stay with me there and not mm-hmm. get all like squirmy and distracted, mm-hmm. uncomfortable, but like, yeah, like, uh huh, like stay mm-hmm. with me, mm-hmm. stay with me. Yes. Stay with me. (laughs) What's one of your favorite (laughs) sensations? What you just did. (laughs) What what happens in my body when you sing? (laughs) Oh my God. Bless. Stroking my kitten fur. I like it. (laughs) Yeah. I think I've asked you this one before and I've asked this one before, but it feels true. If you could be any animal, what animal would you be? Of the jaguar, of course. Yes, honey. She's a jaguar. We feel it. Mm -hmm. Oh, my sweet love. I'm going to land it there. Thank you so much for your time. And I cannot wait for the community listening to become merged with your community, to feel you, to receive your medicine, your support, and more soon. Yes. Amazing. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. That's it for today, Awakened One. And just a quick Thank you from me. Thank you for gifting us with your most precious resource, your time and attention so that we can make this world a more awakened place. And if we're not friends on Instagram yet, then we absolutely should be. So come on over and say hello at Angelica Alana and I'll see you there and see you next week.